Hey, 101ers. So let's begin with uh, the example of perhaps our greatest monumental sculpture. And of course, it was a gift to us by the French, the Statue of Liberty, and whose official title is Liberty Enlightening the World. Uh, as we see, it's a neoclassical sculpture. It's a sculpture done in the neoclassic uh, technique uh, and style that was used in France at the time. And the very name, Liberty, enlightening the world, uh, is intrinsic to French values of liberty uh, during the, what we call the French Enlightenment. So it's clearly a nod to the very principles of individual freedom and liberty on which the United States was also founded. Uh, if you study your founding fathers, you'll, you'll hear that um, many of them get their ideas about independence and liberty from both the French and the Scottish Enlightenment. And as you can see, it's a sculpture of a Roman goddess, uh, and so the goddess of liberty, right? And so we see that the traditions of ancient Greek sculpture uh, are, are migrate to the New World, uh, as we see right here. Um, as you can see, they refer to it as a statue of the icon for, of freedom for the United States. Uh, and of course, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, uh, it was um, erected um, in the late 19th century uh, and coincidentally followed a, uh, was followed by a mass immigration uh, from Europe to the United States. And so many of these immigrant communities coming from places like Ireland and Italy uh, and Spain and places like that, it was the first thing that they saw when they, when they arrived in the United States of America. And, and by all accounts, it was a very moving uh, experience for them. Um, as I said, it's a gift from the people of France, uh, and if you don't know this, it's interesting because it was actually built by uh, Gustave Eiffel, who of course uh, also built the Eiffel Tower. Uh, and as you can see, it was dedicated in 1886. And it has, of course, a famous poem, a famous inscription on the bottom of it. But you may not be aware that that wasn't there originally. It was uh, it was done a little bit later on. Uh, and I'll tell you the story of that here real quickly. It was Emmett Lazarus, uh, a poet, poet of Jewish descent, um, who was asked to create an inscription, a poetic inscription for um, for the statue. And then she initially declined. She thought, you know, she couldn't be passionate about writing a statue, for a, a, a poem for a statue. Um, but as it happened, uh, there was an anti-Semitic pogrom going on in Eastern Europe. Uh, a pogrom is, is when uh, people are forcibly, are forced to flee or, or leave the country. Uh, you're no longer welcome here because you're a Jew. And they were pushing you out. And of course, a lot of these people emigrated as refugees to the United States. And as a Jewish American, she helped these people. She was a very affluent, Amer affluent American. And so she was appalled to find the conditions that these refugees and immigrants had to live in when they came here. And of course, that moved her to write her famous um, stanzas uh, that are on the Statue of Liberty today. And of course, the most famous line of that sonnet, uh, which she uh, entitled The New Colossus, uh, the give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Uh, and that uh, particular line, if not the whole poem, has really come, I, I think it's fair to say, it came to represent a fundamental value uh, of this particular country. Um, and I, I'm, I'm going to try to stick to the facts as much as possible here because I want us to have a conversation about the ideas around these issues. But uh, in this day and age, I would be remiss to not report to you uh, factually that our acting director of U.S. Citizenship and Immigration, Ken Cuccinelli, uh, a couple of years back, uh, attempted during a speech to rewrite this particular stanza. And he uh, quote him, give me your tired and your poor who can stand on their own two feet and who will not become a public charge. Uh, is what he said. And of course, this was going on during the immigration debates about a couple years ago. Uh, he was immediately taken to task for it on Twitter. He went on to uh, CNNBC to defend his ideas uh, and possibly made it worse by saying that uh, the poem was specifically only referring to people coming from Europe, uh, where they had class-based societies, where people were considered wretched, uh, which is another famous word that Lazarus uses, if they weren't in the right class. So he, implying that that it referred only to white people uh, of the lower classes were allowed to come here and seek their fame and fortune. Um, so uh, keep that in mind. Again, uh, I'm going to try not to uh, opinionate too much because I want you guys to really sort of form your own opinions about these things. 
Now, of course, the United States has another uh, famous, a massive monumental sculpture, and that, of course, is Mount Rushmore in the Dakotas. And uh, I'm going to actually skip Rushmore just for a second here because uh, I want to tie it into some of the things we'll talk about soon. So we're going to come back to Rushmore because I'm going to share with you what I think is another truly iconic American monumental sculpture and one that in many ways does sort of bring these Greek uh, ideals uh, to um, modern times and to us here in the United States. And with two distinct exceptions, and it'll be interesting to talk about those. To introduce it, I'll, the first exception, of course, is, um, uh, as we'll learn about here, if you're not familiar with this, this is one of the most famous photographs from World War II. Uh, a, a journalist named Joe Rosenthal, um, during the early days of the Battle of Iwo Jima, was able to capture uh, the famous flag raising, technically the second flag raising, uh, on the hill, sent it back to the, the, uh, the United States, and uh, this image ended up being in all the major newspapers and all the, as an emblem of uh, you know, America success, but also American virtue um, during the latter stages of World War II. It was so moving to people that a young uh, uh, naval um, enlisted man, um, naval sailor, uh, over the weekend created a miniature sculpture from it, what we, what we call a maquette, and of course, ultimately, uh, it would end up to be our Iwo Jima Memorial in the National Plaza. Um, De Weldon was the name of the sailor, and he created a maquette. Now, what a maquette is really just a, a miniature version. You sit at a table with clay, and you create sort of a miniature version of this thing that you'll imagine to be a monumental sculpture later. And uh, through various private entities, uh, everyone thought it was really just a great idea to turn this uh, amazing photograph into something e even more permanent. Uh, and uh, they uh, got a, a, a famous architect, Peasley, to uh, help design the memorial, and of course, as you see here. So that's the one kind of distinction. It, it, and it may be that this is the only sort of major monument in this place, or even the world, that really started as a photographic image. And I think just as, a, as an oddity, that's an interesting thing about it. Um, the second thing, and this is where we see a movement away from the Greek tradition of the ideal right, is that since it was a photograph, and since these were specific people who actually did a real thing, we had evidence of that, right, um, it became a very important point of, uh, of interest to name the soldiers, that is to, to identify exactly who these real people were. And so in uh, principle, this is a, a sculpture of uh, strength and block, and uh, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll skip through, but um, you may be familiar with the name Ira Hayes because Johnny Cash wrote a famous uh, country song about him, I think in the early 1970s, The Ballad of Ira Hayes. Go hit that on your on your music streamer uh, just, to, just to listen to it. Um, and uh, the names are inscribed right on there, right? So it becomes a monument not only to the idealized act of defending one's country, of, de uh, of dying for one's country, and it should be noted that I believe three of the soldiers that were depicted um, later died on Iwo Jima. It's, it, uh, many people sort of assume this is at the end of the battle, but it was actually in the first couple of days when this flag was raised, when they took their first objective, Mount Suribachi, uh, and the fight went on for about another month or so. Uh, and in the course of that month, at least three of the soldiers who were depicted on the statue were killed during the battle. Right? So it becomes a monument uh, to them, becomes a memorial to them, and a monument to their bravery. But again, we're talking about not only a a monument to an ideal about defending one's country, but it's a monument to these specific people, right? And that concept, in this case, it's a very interesting story because recently, about the last three or four years ago, that concept um, became... It, it, the, the import of that concept became clear because it became known that the original uh, inquiry and investigation into who these soldiers were, because they had to go, you know, as you saw in the photograph, you really can't tell, you know, the faces and stuff. So the Marines had to research who these people actually were in this photograph, and they got one wrong. Uh, in fact, it, very interestingly, um, the one that they got wrong, his son wrote a book about the experience, talking about his father's um, experience. It's a famous book called Flags of Our Fathers. It's a great book if you're interested in, in the history of, of this statue as well as the history of Iwo Jima. Um, but the Marines, realizing this, went through a second great effort to correct that. Uh, and, and later 
uh, finally did sort of positively identify who the other Marine was. So it was so important to them to get it right that even, you know, after it kind of didn't matter in some way, they went to correct that record because they wanted this to be a, a memorial and to honor um, the specific people. And again, that's something we don't see generally in ancient Greek sculpture, right? Uh, it wasn't, as Plato called it, the specific instance that was honored, but it was the ideal um, of all the best instances of things, right? Here in the Marine Corps Memorial, uh, we, we want to, we, uh, it, it seems we want to try to do both. And that's an interesting sort of point to think about as we think more about our monuments. All right, well, let's get back into um, Mount Rushmore, uh, which again seems like a very sort of strong national monument, and of course also uh, has likenesses of four specific United States presidents. And um, the interesting thing, if you're not familiar with that, it was actually decide it was it was designed to be less a monument uh, to the virtue of the American democracy and more a tourist attraction. Um, the, uh, as you can see here, uh, Borglum, the sculptor, uh, created the design, but it was, it was, he was essentially commissioned to do it. It was a, a South Dakota historian uh, who had the idea, and he had the idea specifically um, to promote tourism. He wanted people to come um, to South Dakota, and, you know, as you might know, there's not a lot to see there otherwise. Um, uh, and so they thought, well, let's carve this massive monumental sculpture. And of course, he wanted it to be famous people from American history, like Lewis and Clark, again, sort of finding specific people, Red Cloud, Buffalo Bill. But uh, Borglum actually kind of overrode him and thought that the presidents would be yet an even more popular um, and enduring subject. And in many ways, he might have been right about that. Did you know that there is a... Mount Rushmore uh, for the Confederate States of America as well. This is a, a much lesser known in some ways um, monument, but it is indeed um, almost as uh, large and spectac spectacular as Mount Rushmore is. Um, this is, as you can uh, tell from the writing above, um, uh, start carved into Stone Mountain, Georgia. Uh, it is carved at the site of the origination of the modern Ku Klux Klan, who some report still meet on that mountaintop uh, to this day. And of course, it's the answer, if you will, to Mount Rushmore, um, where uh, the three heroic figures of the Confederate States, uh, Robert E. Lee, uh, Stonewall Jackson, and Jefferson Davis are, are mounted in stone. Now, it's, it's interesting because this is something we'll have to consider. Um, this was actually originally private property. Uh, and so it does have a distinction in the debate about Confederate monuments because it is not public land. Um, and of course, on private property, one can uh, erect a sculpture of whoever, whomever they like. And most of the, the issues surrounding our modern um, Confederate sculpture debate uh, have to do with it being on state-owned, government-owned public prop and other public properties, parks, and things like that. Uh, so keep that in mind as we talk about it. And I want to finish up with another national um, uh, monument or, or, or collection that deals with monumental sculptures and, and famous American figures. And it one, might be one, again, that you're not as familiar with. Uh, it's known as the Hall of Statuary in the Capitol building. And what it is, is it's actually a collection of art owned by the United States government. And it really is an interesting and I think sort of nice project because what they did was they invited each of the states to submit two sculptures of figures from that state who represented those states uh, to, to the rest of the country. And they would, originally they, they had, what happened was the Congress used to meet in this hall that you see here, and it got too small, so they built a new one. Um, and then they redesignated this, the, uh, the hall, the rotunda of, uh, of statues, uh, so that it, uh, it would, and it sort of, it sits in between the places, so people, it's a public space, people have to walk through it. So it's, a, it's a very, as you can see, it's a very beautiful um, you know, presentation there. Um, but, in, and, and now the, this, the collection has expanded so much that this that not all the statues are in this place. It's not big enough, so they're all then sort of all over the Capitol building as well. But they, essentially, it's a it's a collection of a hundred figurative sculptures uh, that each state has presented, uh, two per state, of course, to show um, and honor uh, a, a, sta a person from that state. Now, the. <laughs> It's an interesting uh, dilemma in this modern thing because uh, Mississippi chose um, to go ahead and uh, give uh, the national 
collection, a statue of Jefferson Davis. And of course, Jefferson Davis was the uh, president of the Confederate States of America during the Civil War. And again, I, I, I I pulled this from an article in the New Statesman, which is a progressive political magazine out of London. Um, and uh, I tried to sort of, uh, it, it, to give you a sense of uh, the issue here, uh, I, I couldn't think I could explain it to anybody, this, so I'm just going to read this to you. One of Mississippi's two statues is of Jefferson State Davis, the Confederacy's sole president. Davis, astoundingly, also has a pseudo-presidential library in Biloxi, Mississippi, supported by the state of Mississippi itself, although not by the federal agency that administers the libraries of, you know, the actual presidents. The other is of James Zachariah George, a brigadier general in the Confederate Army, uh, and incidentally also one of the original um, signers of these papers of secession when the South seceded. And of course, one of Virginia's two statues is the aforementioned Robert E. Lee. In choosing these men to represent them in the national capital, Mississippi and Virginia are arguing that its greatest contribution to the United States are men mainly known to history for trying to divide them. That's Virginia the birthplace or home of eight U.S. presidents, more than any other state, seven of whom the state apparently sees as less notable than the man who led an army in rebellion against it. And again, there might be a little bit of opinion in that, um, but uh, those are the statues that these states chose to send to the National Monument. Um, If I recall... Jefferson Davis statue was sent uh, right around 1909. Um, and uh, I want you to double check um, all the statistics about Confederate monuments uh, on your Nate Silver uh, readings that you'll see coming up uh, to see why that's such a significant uh, time uh, to do that. That kind of finishes up what I want to talk about, about American monuments and how we'll sort of introduce these ideas and see how they relate to the ideas of Greece. But I've got a couple of other um, uh, monuments to sort of talk talk to you about. And uh, and of course, one of the reasons is is that we actually do have two major significant monuments here right on the Big Island of Hawaii. One, of course, is the Captain Cook Monument. And uh, primarily since it's not a figurative uh, sculpture in this case, it's a, it's a different kind of monument. Um, I'll not talk too much about it. Uh, I do think it's interesting that the, uh, um, the first uh, major monument of the island was to James Cook, the discoverer of the island. Soon, and of course, it was erected by fellow countrymen, as you can see here, in November of 1874. Our other major monument, you might be a little bit familiar with as well, of course, are our King Kamehameha statues. And there's some fascinating stories behind these statues, um, but it also ties in interestingly to our concepts of Greek sculpture in that way. If you're not familiar with uh, the history of these statues, uh, it was it, it, the origins were 1878. Think about that now. That's about four years after uh, the Cook Monument went in. When Walter M. Gibson, a uh, very English-sounding name, a member of the Hawaiian government at the time, wanted to commemorate the 100-year arrival of Captain Cook to the Hawaiian Islands. And that one's a head-scratcher for me. So you're going to commemorate the Captain Cook, but you're putting up a statue of Kamehameha. And so uh, I kind of wonder if that was a bit of an appeasement um, to the Captain Cook monument going up. In any case, the legislator appropriates $10,000 for the project, makes Gibson the director, uh, which was supposed to include Native Hawaiians, but they were soon off the project, and then Gibson ran it by himself. He contacts Thomas Gould, a sculptor um, from Boston, who's actually studying in Florence, as many, uh, to this day, uh, people who want to study especially classical art will go to Europe and study to look at these masterpieces and, and work from them there. But that has an interesting uh, um, feature, uh, gives an interesting feature to our Kamehameha Kamehameha statue, because evidently they sent him photographs of Polynesians um, so he could get the ethnicity correct, uh, make an appropriate likeness. Uh, but apparently he seemed to ignore them uh, because Kamehameha has distinctly European features, including a Roman nose. Um, and the readings that I'm writing sort of politely suggest that this might be due to the fact that Gold was in Italy looking and studying Roman sculpture. Um, and I think there's some credence to that, because look at that sculpture, right? Um, as you can see, the the gesture and things, they're actually fairly similar, right? I think it's pretty interesting that um, that particular pose is eerily similar to our pose of Apollo, 
uh, in that way. And of course, as you think about it, you can see uh, while the cloak is supposed to be one of the Hawaiian feathered cloaks, it has a very distinct um, feel for that classic Greek cloaking that we saw both here in the Greco-Roman copy of Apollo as well as uh, the figures on the Parthenon. Um, and of course, if you're looking closely as well, you can see the classic Greek counterpose, that shift of the hip and the feet set apart uh, to show the weight and the body. So it's clear that this was made by a sculptor who was uh, working in that neoclassic style, uh, looking back to the ancient Greece. So we have a uh, we have a very nice example uh, of this particular part of history in our in our Kamehameha statue. Uh, the other interesting thing, if you don't know about this, and again, I'll just give you a quick story. Um, was that this thing sunk in the middle of the ocean. Did you know that? Yeah, they uh, put it on a boat. He made it in, in Italy, put it on a boat, and the ship sunk near the Falkland Islands. And fortunately, uh, the Hawaiians had insured it. So as soon as they realized it was lost, um, they went ahead and, and, and cast the second one and sent it over. Uh, but before it actually came, the original, and this is a fascinating story. I won't go into it too deep, Italy, but it was it was, it was. was unearthed in its watery grave. They rediscovered it and they actually brought it to the island. So we actually have two copies of this. Uh, the original one that spent months at the bottom of the sea uh, is right here in the Kohala district. Uh, and then, of course, the second one you may know uh, is in the um, state capital, as you can see that there. So this was the one that was recast and sent the second time. And if you go over to Hilo side so much, you know that there's actually a third Kamehameha statue in Hilo. Now, that was also a commercial enterprise, if you're familiar with that. And you can see it's not the same statue, but it is similar um, in its uh, figuration. Notice the counterpose isn't quite as dynamic uh, in that way. But uh, it was commissioned by the Princeville Corporation for a resort in Kauai. And I think this is a great story. The Kauai, Kauai wouldn't have it, though, literally or figuratively. Um, since they were never conquered by King Kamehameha, they were like, get this guy off our island. Uh, and so it ended up in Hilo for that reason. Right. And to finish up our lecture today, just in case you were wondering uh, when we were talking about the uh, Jefferson Davis statue at the Hall of Statuary, um, you know, which statues Hawaii sent? And of course, being the last date, they sent theirs in 1969. But uh, they chose Father Damien, uh, of course, who was the, uh, I believe, Catholic missionary, right, who, who set up the mission in Molokai and, and, and uh, lived there for the better, I think, 20 years or so. Um, before he would find the contracted leprosy and die, but he lived there uh, helping and healing the lepers and on Molokai. And of course, the second one was Kamehameha. And this is the statue of Kamehameha that appears in our nation's capital today. Now, um, the other interesting thing about this is you see it, it's a third copy. They actually made a cast of the Kamehameha statue in Honolulu to reproduce it and send this one off to the Washington, um, to the Capitol in Washington. So if you get to Washington, D.C. at any point in your life, make sure you visit so you can see the statues that Hawaii sent. Okay, we'll see you on Wednesday, and we'll talk more about monumental sculpture and uh, its role in our uh, world, political world, today.